So Julie Halston, it's a pleasure to talk to you, having seen you on stage many times. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It With Charles Bush and in Gypsy, in fact. Um, so it uh, goes back a ways, our relationship. We just didn't know it. We just didn't know it. But yes, uh, going back with Charles Bush goes back quite a long way. That's the 19... 19- 80s. I know, but and we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we do, we're going to go a little bit further back. Oh. What do you think the young girl, the young woman who participated in the Senior Follies at Holy Family High School would have to say about the career that you've had so far? That is so crazy that you bring that up because literally... I was out on Long Island this past weekend for a high school reunion. Um, Yeah, it was a lot. I honestly would say to her to stop being fearful and trust your instincts. And it took me a long time to trust my instincts, but there were a number of decisions that I made in life that, you know, were not good, you know, hindsight, you know, tells us that. But one of the things, one of the times I trusted my instincts was when I saw Charles Bush in his one man show called Alone with a Cast of Thousands. And I was like, so blown away, I decided to sort of get on his train Clearly, it was not for money. You know, we were doing these shows in a crack den. I mean, let's really be real here. So it wasn't a money thing or anything, but my instinct told me, do this. I went to Hofstra University out on Long Island. I, I really didn't know what I was doing, Craig. I, 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 I was... I had instincts, I had thoughts, I didn't have a really, I didn't have, you know, a sort of formalized training. Uh, I I certainly probably could never have gotten into a place like Juilliard. Uh, I I was very um, unfocused. And when I saw Charles Bush, I realized that I was also a bit of an outlier. I was a funny woman, but I didn't know how to get myself into a position to launch. And it was really Charles Bush who said, I'm going to write for you and I'm going to help launch you. And he did. And he did what, 14 plays? Yeah. And I'm forever grateful. (laughs) And, And dare I say, it built my confidence. And we also had so much fun. And of course it was a time, the 1980s was a very tough time in New York City. The AIDS epidemic was rampant. So many incredible people were dying of this terrible disease. We were losing friends and acquaintances, colleagues, and our theater company really helped people get by. We were making shows that made people laugh and forget their troubles in a way. And um, doing fundraisers, of course, uh, raising money for those that could not take care of themselves anymore. It was a very, very dark time in New York City in many ways, but also a very inspiring time. Well, if you were if you were to go back in time to that first performance of Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, which was at the Limbo Lounge. What stands out to you most about that night? Because you mentioned that that you had seen Charles and now here's a play that he's written and you're in it. It's like, that was, you had no idea that that was the beginning of what it became, right? I had no idea, but I will tell you this, and this is really all the truth. This is not, it's part of the myth of our company, but it's really, really the truth. I was rehearsing with the company because he had put together a company right before he met me and I was the newest member. 
I didn't understand the style at that point, and I was really not doing very well in rehearsal. And again, here's my instinct. I turned to the company one night. I remember this very well. I said, look, guys, I know in rehearsal, I really stink. But you put me on that stage in a wig in front of 60 gay men, and I am going to glow. And that is exactly what happened. And I'm not joking. I got on that stage and somehow I was transformed. And literally, as Charles said, you just, that stage lit up. And that's when the company said, Charles, you have to make her a permanent member and you have to write for her. And I, I th again, that was an instinct. Uh, and you know, to this day, I'm terrible in rehearsal, terrible. I don't, I, it takes me a long time to find what I'm gonna do, but so much of what I do depends on the audience giving me back because comedy particularly is the, the, the creative process is, you know, put together by the audience and the performer. Well, it's interesting you say that because I'm, I'm flashing back to another show that you did, which was in 2014 at 54 Below, which was a tribute to Aaron's and Flaherty. And yes. you, performed, you performed with Annalie Ashford. Yes. And you did Funny the Duck Joke. Yes. Where you're teaching her how to have comedic timing, how to trust her comedic instincts. Yes. Was, did you just develop them on your own or did you have somebody who could help guide you? No, I, I well, first of all, what was so ironic was for me to be teaching someone like Anna Lee, who is a genius, but you know, we have so much fun and we're friends and it was great. Uh, by 2014, I certainly had developed, I think a real confidence in how to go about looking at material, you know, um, figuring out the beats, figuring out the rhythms. Um, so, but so much of what I have learned comedically did come from those early, early days of theater in limbo with Charles Bush and Ken Elliott, who was our director, was also very helpful to me in really um, helping me understand how to uh, not break up a line, how to put emphasis on certain words. Plus I did develop my own style which was that, you know, I have a very, I have a very strong Long Island accent at times. You know what I'm saying? But then it was Charles who said, well, you know, you're also very grand dumb, you know, you can, you can do that kind of thing. And, you know, and it was really, um, you know how artists are, they, they, they're like sponges, you know, they, they watch old movies and they pick up an accent. They listen to people that they love or find interesting or whatever. Uh, and they, they're like sponges and, you know, sponges absorb. And um, after a while you find out what works. And also I was so lucky, the Roundabout Theater does a lot of revivals. And because of the way I learned how to perform with Charles Bush, it was very helpful to me when I started doing Kaufman and Hart and all these plays from the 1930s where you really have to talk fast, you know, darling. It's all in there, you know, and it's that kind of thing. I got to tell you, one of the things that they don't really, now they might at Juilliard, I don't know, I didn't go to Juilliard, but um, in a lot of uh, acting schools is, you know, that kind of rhythm has to be fast. You know, it's, it's Roz Russell in, you know, Gal Friday. I mean, you got it, you, 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 that's all those 1940s, 1930s uh, movies. Uh, I learned a lot from those movies, rhythms, comedy rhythms. Well, and, and so did Charles. Charles well, learned a lot from those movies as well. He absorbed, I think from the time he was probably in his mother's womb, you know, because he 
sat and watched all those movies from the time he was a kid until, of course, it, he's still watching them. Um, but it was so helpful because there are many long passages in Charles's plays and there are many long passages in plays like Kaufman and Hart um, or uh, Ben Hecht, you know, um, those, you know, 20th century and things like that. Long passages that really have to be done in a particular rhythm. And that rhythm is generally very fast. And uh, that's something I think really needs to be kind of taught to um, maybe the younger generation today, because there's a lot of, you know, wanting to be realistic and authentic or whatever. And it's like, no, darling, sometimes, sometimes artifice is the most authentic. I mean, it really is, you know, I, I always say to people, I'm so artificial, I'm authentic, <laughs> you know, I'm very much like lip syncer, you know? So, because yes, people don't really talk like that, but for those kind of driven characters, they had that kind of rhythm and it makes for great comedy. Right. You know, it's interesting. I, I saw an interview that Charles gave in 2009 to DC theater scene. Um, and he described the two of you not as Will and Grace, but more like Lucy and Viv. And I'm yes. wondering if do you, I gather you agree with him. Yes, because his characters, in fact, we just actually re, just recently reread his play, A Lady in Question. Um, generally, the character he plays is someone who's very beautiful, very talented and very vain and usually has a fatal flaw. And which is kind of like Lucy, you know, like it's like, oh, Viv, come on, we're just gonna get into showbiz. And, you know, Viv is the one who says, what are you crazy, Lucy? You don't know what you're doing, you know, and Ricky's gonna kill you. Uh, and that is the character that I generally play like Kitty, Kitty, the Countess de Borgia in Lady in Question. I'm the one who says, you know, you're nuts. We got to get out of Nazi Germany and we got to get out of here. And, you know, and she has to be taught a lesson. And uh, it's like that in Times Square Angel as well. I, I played one of her friends in Times Square Angel who was the one who was, you know, realistic. And then of course, like Lucy and, and Viv, uh, oh, she talks me into it and we both get in trouble. You know, <laughs> and that's kind of that's kind of what happens. But of course, as we all know, it always ends up in the end as an OK thing. And we learn our lessons as a well. <laughs> So well, uh, but yes, we are. And and very interestingly. Because Charles has performed with lots of incredible people. Uh, we were very lucky that somehow we had a chemistry that just took off from the stage and people really loved seeing us together. And uh, it, it, it has not gone away. All these years later, it has not gone away. Nor apparently has the desire to see you at Birdland. Um, uh, apparently like not, a it's crazy booked. It's like, call the fire department. But that's how it always works with you. You you make one show, you book it, and then you come back and do it multiple times. I mean, you yeah. have, you have been very successful doing that. And I know that this show, Declassified, is going to offer your perspective on where we are in the world today. And I'm wondering, given the last two and a half, pushing three years, do you think we've learned anything? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the problem. No. Uh, <laughs> You know, one of the things that uh, I'm so grateful for is, um, first of all, a, a shout out to Birdland and Jim Caruso, uh, who runs the cast party and who also books me every year at Birdland. And he was the one who came up with Virtual Halston, the YouTube show that we did during the pandemic. And it really became a very big success. And, you know, I was hoping, of course, you know, to get back to a live stage situation. I thought, oh, maybe after a year, this will happen, you know? Well, as we know, it's gone on and on and we're not 
quite out of the woods yet and, and all that. But this will be the first time appearing on that stage in, in, in like three years. So it's very special. And I don't know if we've really learned a lot. I hope that what we've learned is to be kinder to people. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, there's been a lot of loss the last three years and um, in many different ways. And I just hope that we can ultimate be, ultimately be a little kinder. Of course, being kind don't know, doesn't always make good comedy. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, if we're going to talk, well, we have to get a little dishy. I mean, that's what comedy can be a little dishy. So I have a variety of uh, topics that I am going to address. Uh, one of them is a, a, a nude beach that I ended up at recently. I, I, I can't even, I can't. I mean, really, I can't. Mm -hmm. I did not expect this. I was fully clothed, but as I said to the man I was with, why is it that people who should not even be nude in a shower insist on going to a nude beach? It's like, you just can't believe it. So I'm going to be addressing that. I'll be addressing the, the, addressing the uh, pandemic. I always tell a story about my mom, my late mom. Uh, I will also be addressing the fact that I have started dating after my late husband passed away. And of course that always, you know, engenders uh, opinions. <laughs> And I am also going to be addressing the Queen Elizabeth funeral uh, because, you know, uh, it's, it's a topic. And of course, one of the other topics is Meghan Markle. Uh, so I'm going to be addressing, you know, a lot of things that have been in the news lately. And, uh, and of course, I always do a reading of a wedding announcement, <laughs> either from the New York Times or Vogue magazine. And I have one that I think is going to really inspire people. As um, long as as long as it's on par with the Ann Landers well, letter about, yes. about, about about you know drugs and tanning salons because oh, that's yes. classic. Oh yes, that is classic. It is classic, and quite frankly, thank you for bringing that up. It is the first reading I ever really did. Um, it became my signature reading. It was my late husband who said rip that out right now. And I always close the show with it. And I will be closing the show with, you know, that as well. Yeah, um, no matter how many times I hear it, I still crack up because it is inconceivable that somebody would actually vomit that up onto a piece of paper and send it into Ann Landers. I, 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 and do, can I tell you, this really made me very, very happy. Um, I found this out years later but um, a friend of mine actually sent a tape. He always, he always made uh, compilation tapes. And apparently that reading was sent to Robin Williams. And he loved it so much. And he would just play it over and over again. And just apparently just, just loved it. And that made me, that just warmed my heart. and. Of course, yeah. of course. Why wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Now, one, one thing that got me through the pandemic was virtual Halston. Oh. I loved it. I felt like I was, I've always been a big believer that the, the idea of a salon is something that is sorely missing that I think society could really benefit from. And I felt like those, those episodes were a salon. The only challenge for me is they were at five o'clock in the afternoon in New York, so that, which means I was having a martini at two o'clock. So- well but during the pandemic, I mean, let's face facts. I remember a girlfriend of mine calling me at like 11 in the morning and saying, I think it's too early to open a bottle of wine. I was like, it, it might be, it might be, that might be too early, but yes, I know, I know. And, but I know also a lot of my friends in LA, they would just sort of gather around and, and watch. And, you know, it was so lovely having First of all, Jim and Ruby, Ruby Lochnar, our, techno, our technician and also sort of co-host along with Jim Caruso, who's also just hilarious, 
we got the most incredible talent. Bill Irwin, Nathan Lane, you know, um, oh gosh, Louis Black, Santino Fontana, you, you know, I, I mean, Mary Lou Henna. It was just, when I look back, and of course we were all sitting in front of our computers, you, you know? And Paul Rudnick and Peter Bartlett, I mean, that still remains one of my favorite episodes ever, but I loved every episode and I loved all my guests. And um, you just learn so much about creative people, which is exactly what you're doing right now. I mean, but you do, right. you learn so much. I learned so much about friends of mine that I've known for years, but I learned even more. And also just that we had so many fun tales and funny stories and, and uh, oh my goodness. And of course, I always loved reading Joan Crawford <laughs> because you know, Joan Crawford is my Bible. You yes, know. well, it, it, Charles seems to appreciate Joan Crawford quite a bit too. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> you have that um, in common. Well, yes. what did, I, I, obviously getting the, you know, getting a Tony award doesn't hurt. But what did doing virtual Halston do for you? How did that help you through that challenging time? Well, first of all, and I, again, I don't mean to get emotional, but uh, my husband passed away in 2018. And then in 2019, I, I, I did Tootsie on Broadway. And that really, really saved my life and you know when you become a widow it's 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 like a, a whole half of you just dies you know it's just terrible it's just awful as i said to a, a friend you you wear this cloak of grief but it doesn't offer any protection you know it's just a, it's so tootsie really helped me but then tootsie was over and suddenly we were in lockdown. And that's when it really hit me that I was alone. Because, you know, I'm such a social person. I live in the, the midtown, you know, in New York City. We were, I'm always able to see friends and, you know, everything is very convenient in New York City. I have a great community around me. We really could not see each other during those early days. And I think my widowhood became uh, very pronounced during the pandemic. And it was really Jim and Ruby who said, Julie, if anyone should have a talk show <laughs> where you yak about stories and you have friends on and it should be you. And you know, he asked me three times before I said yes. And he said, I'll help you with this. And I have to say, it was something to look forward to every week. I did all my research during the week. So it gave me, you know, an outlet. Uh, because in the beginning, you know, we really didn't go out. Everything was shuttered. And it really gave me a focus. Um, it was a way for me to connect. Uh, and you know what? I do, I'm, I am a people person. I know that just sounds, that just sounds horrifying, doesn't it? No, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it sounds positively shocking. I could never have imagined that. Yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I am, I, I, I adore people. I adore creative people, especially. They're just so interesting. Uh, and I love hearing, people's stories you know I mean I love to talk about myself but shockingly I actually do have an interest in other others you know as well I might not listen to others on stage but during <laughs> virtual Holston I really loved listening to people's stories and everyone has a great story um so it really helped me get through such a terrible time such a lonely time I know a lot of people were lonely and terribly lonely but I think being a widow, I think it was very pronounced for me because, you know, uh, and uh, I, 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 I'm completely convinced that somehow my, my, my late husband 
because he was always on me to do something like that. And he loved coming to Birdland and watch my show. That he, I mean, that was his favorite thing. He just loved it. So I think somehow the universe told me, do this. And as you know, we were able to raise money for my charity, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. And people were so generous. I cannot tell you how generous people were. So it, 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 it was a wonderful thing. And, you know, we, Jim and I talk about maybe in the future doing like once a month virtual Halston, both live stream and in person. So we might do that in, in, in terms of Birdland. So it's well, that's just, also something you could tour as well, because not everybody is based in New York. So you could pick up talent that's based in Los Angeles or Nashville or Chicago or anywhere else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've actually, because I do Broadway belts every year to raise money uh, here in New York. That's obviously why the Isabel Stevenson Award came my way. But I've been wanting to do Broadway belts in, um, in Los Angeles because, you know, there's so much talent there. Absolutely. And, and it, I think it would just be sensational. So that's, you know, and then Chicago as well, you know, well, anywhere, quite frankly. You well, know, it's, it's, it's interesting. In 2015, you, you, wrote, you wrote, uh, wrote a story for Sandy Klein's Conversations with Creative Women, which was basically about how aging sucks. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking you've got Declassified coming up. Virtual Halston was a success. You got the Tony. You did Tootsie. You were part of it just like that. It seems to me, Julie, like you are trying to flip a bird to F. Scott Fitzgerald and prove to him that there are second acts in American life? Well, it's very, very interesting that you say that because I feel that there are third and fourth acts, quite frankly. Um, unless, unless you've decided to either retire or just say, this is enough is enough. Uh, I really believe that you can keep going and constantly be reinventing. And yeah, I, I have no plans to slow down in any way, shape or form. Uh, I will say, Botox helps. I'm not going to deny it. I embrace it. <laughs> I embrace it. Um, you know, I think we should do what, what you want to do and keep going. You know, I'm in an industry that, you know, age is not your friend. Too bad. I'm going to work anyway. Too bad. And that's something I love to name drop, by the way, love to name drop. But you know, my dear friend, Rosie O'Donnell, you know, we're Comacians, we're Comac girls from Long Island. She would say to me all the time, you know, oh, Halston, don't let anyone define you. You know, you, do, you, you define yourself. You, you tell them what you're gonna do. Guess what? She's right, she's right. You don't, you don't let them tell you, oh, you can't do that, you know? Oh, you can't be in that show, you can't. Oh, oh, I can't. Oh, okay. So I guess I'll, I'll do my own show. And then you'll love this show so much. I'll be in the next show. That's what happens. So right. I, it's, it's really important to, particularly for women, I think, to just say, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not letting you stop me. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Look, I mean, so many people in this world I, and I love that we're having this uh, conversation on Indigenous People's Day. So many people have been told no, 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 and no. And we're saying, yeah, we can. Yeah, we will. Not stopping us. And yeah, we have. And yeah, we have. And you're not going to take it away from us. Yeah, right. No, so, us. so let me conclude by asking you about something that you said in your Tony Award acceptance speech where you said that from the age of nine, your dream was to be in the theater. You've certainly more than accomplished that. What are your dreams today? Well, I actually have 
three dreams. Uh, I would love to be back on a stage. And because I really, really love being on a stage in front of a live audience. And I love being on a Broadway stage. Broadway is special. It just is. That's one dream. I would like to do more TV. I, last year, I had the great privilege of playing a recurring character on And Just Like That and Gossip Girl. And I had so much fun. And I finally got so much more comfortable with that milieu. And HBO Max has been very good to Julie Halston. So that would be nice to continue that. And um, the other is that I am on this mission and two, two missions. One is that I want to continue my work with the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. Uh, we have seen growth in the last 12 years that has been so phenomenal. When I joined the organization, we had like four care networks for pulmonary patients. We have 68 now. Uh, it's really my life's work to help patients and caregivers and eventually a cure for this terrible disease. The other is that I, one of the things that has happened during uh, COVID is the theater has really kind of crashed and burned a little. And let's face it, with all the live streaming, with all the content out there, a lot of people, I know a lot of people personally who say, well, I don't know if I wanna come back to the theater and live theater, it's a little scary now and it's too expensive. And I'm also gonna make it my mission to continue this incredible live performance tradition and great plays, great new plays and great plays in the, you know, the, the, the classic canon. Uh, you know, uh, it's been going on for thousands of years. I don't want it to die. Well, you're talking to somebody who has already, I have already booked my shows for my November trip um, because I can't imagine not being in a theater. Uh, you don't know how many times my husband gives me grief for the amount of time that I am not home because I'm going to concerts or plays or musicals or whatever it is. Yeah, but the fact is it enriches. It so enriches your life. And uh, it's my church, you know, it's my church. Right. And I do think there are still people in the future that need to go to church. <laughs> and want to go to church and need to go to church. And that church is important for our lives as human beings, you know, not just, you know, self-involved crazy people. I mean, <laughs> there's that too, but, <laughs> you know, but, but to enrich our lives as human beings and to help other human beings. It sounds very noble, but guess what? It, it is very noble. So those, those are my missions go back to the theater, keep that mission going, keep my work with the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation going and to do more TV and also to get um, another window treatment for my bedroom. <laughs> well, I have a feeling the window treatment will be the easiest one to do quickly. <laughs> so. Well, this has been a total delight, Julie. Thank you so much for taking time. Uh, you are delightful. This was wonderful. I didn't know what to expect, but I'm so glad we did it. And, and I, I, I am very, too. Very much. Thank you. And I, is it all right if I post this on our YouTube channel? Absolutely. And I just want to tell people if they can't, you know, get into Birdland, it's going to be live streamed. <laughs>